10 is Anne Frank's Attic. For those of you who don't know, Anne Frank was a German born Jewish girl who kept a diary in which she documented life in hiding from 1942 to 1944 during the German occupation of the Netherlands in World War II. She wrote every day in her diary about her life from her family's hiding place in an Amsterdam attic. Her diary was eventually published and it's now one of the world's best known books. Now this photo is not of Anne but of her father Otto in 1960 revisiting the attic where the family hid. He was the sole survivor of his family so I can't imagine the pain he had revisiting this place. Later the photographer Arnold Newman recalled taking this photo. He said the mood was depressing and I immediately began photographing him. After a few moments the Westertorn bells next door began to ring. Those were the bells that Anne wrote about. He suddenly broke down completely weeping uncontrollably and then so did I. We never met again. To this day when I lecture or tell his story to people I find I choke up. I still can't help myself. Number 9 An Inmate at the Rab Camp The Rab Camp was one of several Italian concentration camps and it was established during World War II in July 1942 on the Italian occupied island of Rab now in Croatia. Estimates of the Commission for Determining the Crimes of the Occupier say 4,641 detainees died at the camp, including 800 inmates who died while being transported from Rab to other concentration camps in Italy. In July 1943, after the fall of the fascist regime in Italy, the camp was closed, but some of the remaining Jewish prisoners were deported by German forces to the extermination camps. Under Italian Army Commander Mario Rotata's watch, the ethnic cleansing and violence committed against the Slovene civilian population included summary executions, hostage taking and ending the hostages' lives, reprisals, and the burning of houses and villages. Slovenes and Croatians suffered from cold and hunger in open air tents, surrounded by barbed wire fence and guarded towers. At its peak, there were up to 15,000 internees. Conditions at the camp were described as a Hauling, filthy, muddy, overcrowded, and swarming with insects. This photo just shows how much suffering they went through. Number 8. A Jail Cell from the Salem Witch Trials This makeshift jail cell truly brings out the horrors of the Salem Witch Trials. These trials were a series of hearings and prosecutions of people accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1693. More than 200 people were accused, 30 people were found guilty, 19 of whom were executed by hanging. Now women vastly outnumbered men in the ranks of accused and executed. It was in cells like this one that the accused witches spent their final moments before being executed. Now it's just sad because we all know that this was just a scare and that they weren't real witches. Many of these women were suspected and chosen because they were simply unliked. Moving on to number 7 we have the nuclear shadow. On August 6, 1945 the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb was so powerful that people up to a mile of it were vaporized. All that was left of them was their shadows burnt into stone. This is a creepy image that shows one of the bomb's victims. It's a silhouette of an elderly man or woman with a cane. So the bomb's light and heat were so powerful that it bleached any exposed surfaces. In this case, the person's body shielded that part on the sidewalk and that's why an imprint was left there. All around Hiroshima, there were multiple of these body outlines. It's very disturbing and sad. It just shows their final moments alive. In our sixth spot today, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment set out to explore the psychological effects of imprisonment. It started on August 14th, 1971. A university psychology professor gathered a bunch of student volunteers and divided them into groups. 11 were assigned the role of guards and 10 were assigned the role of prisoners. It's going to be a two week experiment where the volunteers would play their part in a make believe prison. But the experiment had to be ended after only six days. The volunteers got way into character. Some guards turned sadistic. They really exercised their power over the prisoners, whereas many prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. The study and this creepy photo provide a chilling look at what humans are capable of. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the wild man suit. Not only is this a dark photo from history,
mystery, but it's also a very mysterious one. This suit that you're seeing is what historians named the Wild Man suit. It consists of a double layered set of armor covered in one inch long iron nails. What was it used for, you may ask? Well, no one knows for sure. One popular theory is that it was used during bear hunting in the 1800s, or it was used in bear baiting. Don't know if that's true, but it looks very uncomfortable to wear. Maybe it was a twisted torture device. The executioner would wear it and then give the prisoner a nice big and tight hug. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but either way, it's messed up. In our fourth spot today, we have the ruins of Hiroshima. Here is another very scary and sad photo taken after America dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb had an explosive yield equal to 15,000 tons of TNT. In fact, it destroyed five square miles of the city. This photo shows the ruins of the once beautiful city. Buildings and wildlife were completely destroyed destroyed by this bomb. In fact, the US remains to be the only country to ever use an atomic bomb in war. It had a huge lasting impact on the city that we should never forget about. In our third spot today, we have the Titanic. On April 15th, 1912, the infamous ship, the Titanic, began to sink. 1,500 passengers sank with the ship after a hit an iceberg during its maiden voyage. The few that did manage to survive fled on lifeboats. This is a picture of the last lifeboat approaching the rescue ship. You can see it was crammed with passengers as all the lifeboats were. This photo serves as a reminder of this great tragedy in history and all the innocent individuals that were impacted by this disaster. In our second spot today, we have the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In 1906, San Francisco was hit with a massive 7.9 magnitude earthquake. It has since garnered the title of the most powerful earthquake in Northern Californian history. This earthquake not only caused homes to come crumbling down, but it also started a number of fires throughout the city. Hundreds of fires started as a result of the broken gas gas lines. These fires went on for three days, engulfing 500 city blocks. More than 3,000 people passed away from the earthquake and fires. 20,000 buildings were destroyed and 200,000 citizens were left homeless. It was very sad and tragic. This is a photo from this devastating time. This was after all the damage was done. People lined the streets and just stared at the destruction that the earthquake caused. And in our number one spot today, we have the American Buffalo. Now this photo is absolutely heartbreaking. This was taken in 1892 Michigan and that is an actual mountain made up of buffalo skulls. That means thousands of buffaloes were slaughtered. No wonder why the buffalo population is considered near threatened and are at risk for extinction. So these skulls were then ground down to be used in making bone china or refining sugar and producing fertilizer. It's said that around the end of the 18th century there were between 30 to 60 million buffaloes on the continent. When this photo was taken the population was at only 456. They literally slaughtered millions of buffalo. What makes it worse is that some of the buffalo were killed purposely just so that the indigenous individuals were deprived of them. All right, guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments below which one of these pictures gave you the heat. Kicking off our list at number 10, the reindeer gift. We'll turn the clocks back to 1941, right off the hop. When the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union, it was of course one of the biggest attacks in history. Britain and the United States had to send over weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. Now they sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, that was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats, you know, war stuff. So thankfully the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn the Soviets were able to fight on. As a gift, as a thank you rather, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, they sent him a live reindeer. That the British, of course, had to accept because it was ill-mannered if you don't. So they had to keep a six foot tall, real life living reindeer on a submarine. Must be comfortable, awesome. Imagine the smell. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was tiny, she's the cutest little thing. She was a crew member for six weeks, which is honestly hilarious because you know some of those guys got way too attached, you know for sure. She slept better than most, if I'm being honest, she shared her room in the captain's quarters. Again, imagine the smell. I don't know, is it worth it? I've always wanted a baby goat growing up, so this is kind of the closest thing. I'm jealous, I'm weirdly jealous. Number nine, Stalin Photoshop. Deep fakes are getting out of hand. I have no idea what's real or what's fake anymore. To be honest, I'm not even Taylor. I'm actually a living
Olivia doing a list right now, but it's been deep faked so well that you believe it. Modern technology is really making it hard to tell what's real and what's not, but it goes back. Back in 1939, a photo of Stalin was published and he looks normal. He actually looks kind of great. Some would say he looks way too good. You know what I mean? He was touching up photos as far back as 1939, just airbrushing, just digitally removing all those zits and stuff. Like really, that far back? But even if you got a photo with Stalin, there's a chance that you yourself would be digitally removed. Like Nikolai Yitzhov, for example, the leader of the NKVD. He was in a photo with Stalin, but around 1937, Nikolai was responsible for orders that had over 1 million people arrested. So it wasn't ideal to be in a photo with Nikolai at the time. So he was denounced, imprisoned, and he died in 1940. So Stalin had him digitally erased and replaced in a photo. That's pretty hilarious. I don't know, this man was ahead of his time via Photoshop. How did he do it? How did they do it? No one knows. Number eight, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Nice, I remember this one. I heard about this on LimeWire. That was cool. Heard about that at full volume. This was a huge presidential scandal. Back when you, you know, didn't happen every other week and stuff, this was a big deal. It was 1998 and Clinton's White House intern Monica Lewinsky was 22 years old at the time. Yeah, young. When you think back to all this old history, you're like, oh, they were this. No, very young, extremely young. They had a situation from 1995 to 1997, despite what LimeWire told us. Lewinsky said she hooked up with Bill nine different times at the White House, and apparently, according to her schedule, Hillary Clinton was at the White House for at least seven of those times. She's like, what's going on in there, huh? Is that my, who is that? Number seven. Pyramids on the moon. In 1972, this image was taken by Apollo 17 during its flight to the moon near an area known as Geophone Rock. NASA listed the image as blank, but after retouching the photo, you can see that it's not completely blank. Turning up the contrast, a pyramidal structure can be seen. So, what is it? Was it some malfunction of the camera, or is there actually a pyramid on the moon? NASA has never given a credible version of the issue, which has led to some speculations about what actually can be on the moon, hidden from the public. And listen, not to be a crazy conspiracy theorist, but maybe it is true that aliens built the pyramids on Earth as they looked like they did it on the moon too. I don't know, but it gives you a lot to think about. While this eye looks like it may belong to a scary monster, it's actually a human eye. While rummaging through photographs that capture the devastating impact of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this photo emerged. On the 6th and 9th of August 1945, the United States detonated two atomic for the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. The aerial bombings together ended the lives between 129,000 and 226,000 people, people most of whom were civilians. When the bomb detonated at 1,900 feet above the city center of Hiroshima, the subsequent explosion caused temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to annihilate nearly everything within 1,600 feet of last zone. Almost anything and anyone within a mile was destroyed. And he were so extreme that they bleached the city's exposed surfaces, except in places where an unsuspecting person shielded the building or sidewalk or bridge from the blast with their own body in their final moments alive. Now this is what the eye of an victim plied by an atomic Rack looks like. While it had been a well known fact that radiation causes cataracts in animals, the development of atomic cataracts in human beings was noted after the atomic in Japan. Now, it wasn't just this person who suffered from this, but many others as well. Number five, the Babushka Lady. The woman in the brown coat, or the babushka lady as she was later called by the FBI, was very close to JFK when he was assassinated in Dallas. Traveling in a presidential motorcade through downtown Dallas, JFK was assassinated hit once in the back and once in the head. Kennedy was taken to Parkland Hospital for emergency medical treatment, where he was pronounced dead 30 minutes later. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald was charged with Kennedy's assassination, he denied. Oswald then was assassinated as well soon after. These theories allege the involvement of the CIA, the Mafia, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, Cuban Prime Minister Federal Castro, the KGB, or some combination. Now, according to eyewitnesses, though, this woman, the babushka lady, filmed the entire thing. It's thought that from her vantage point, she may have been able to answer some critical questions about what really happened that day. However, the FBI was never able to track her down, and no one has since been able to figure out the identity of this mystery observer. Number four, 
human zoos. Yes, you might have thought that zoos were strictly for animals, but once upon a time there were human zoos, which I personally find disgusting. Now this photo was taken in 1904 where the US government imported 1,300 indigenous Filipinos from different tribes to display at the St. Louis Exposition in 1904. Yeah, you heard that right. The government did this, but are we really that surprised? The zoos were public displays of people, usually in so-called natural or primitive state, to be seen and gawked at. These zoos were most prominent during the 19th and 20th centuries, and in the 1870s, exhibitions of so-called exotic populations became popular throughout the Western world. Human zoos could be seen in many of Europe's largest cities, such as Paris, Hamburg, London, Milan, as well as American cities such as New York City and Chicago. These people were zoo attractions among the monkeys and lizards to show off the new US possessions. These people were often bound by ropes and visitors threw peanuts at them. The treatment of these human beings was just awful. Number 3. The Diet Love Pass Incident the Diet Love Pass incident was an event in which nine Soviet hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, under uncertain circumstances. This creepy photo shows the determined group traversing the harsh terrain just before they met their fate on the night of February 1st. The experienced trekking group from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, led by Igor Dyatlov, had established a camp in the Russian SFSR of the Soviet Union. Now, overnight, something caused them to cut their way out of their tent and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. Now, after the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six of them had died from hypothermia, while the other three had died by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in his skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of those four had damaged soft tissue of the head and face. Two of the bodies had missing eyes, one had a missing tongue, and one had missing eyebrows. Number two, treatment of a patient with mental illness. This 1890 photo depicts a woman forced into a crucifixion pose and facing a wall. The woman is a patient at a mental institution undergoing treatment. Now, believe it or not, forced standing was considered a legitimate part of treatment for mental illness in 19th century Germany. Now, back in the 18th and early 20th century, women were sometimes institutionalized due to their opinions and their inability to be controlled properly by a primarily male-dominated culture. There were financial incentives too, because before the passage of the Married Women's Property Act 1882, all of a wife's assets passed automatically to her husband. The men who were in charge of these women, either a husband, father, or brother, could send these women to mental institutions, stating they believed that these women were mentally ill because of their strong opinions. These men had the last say when it came to the mental mental health of these women, so if they believed that these women were mentally ill, or if they simply wanted to silence the voices and opinions of these women, they could easily send them to mental institutions. This is what could have happened to this woman in that photograph. Now, besides standing, practices at these asylums were dark as they had treatments that included restraints, isolation, electroshock therapy, ice baths, forced drugging, and even lobotomies. And coming at number one is mustard gas tested on American military. Mustard gas is a type of chemical warfare agent, and as a chemical weapon, mustard gas was first used in World War I. In 1943, the US Navy exposed its own sailors to mustard gas. Now, officially, the Navy was testing the effectiveness of new clothing and gas masks against the deadly gas that had proven so terrifying in the First World War. Young men were approached after eight weeks of boot camp and asked if they wanted to participate in an experiment that would help shorten the war. Obviously, they said yes, but they didn't know what they were signing up for. Only when the boys reached the research laboratory were they told the experiment involved mustard gas. Now, the participants, almost all of whom suffered several external and internal burns, were ignored by the Navy and in some cases were threatened with the Espionage Act. In 1991, the reports were finally declassified and taken before Congress. At number 10, parkour gone wrong. I'm sure you've all seen an example of parkour before, but I would personally describe it as people launching themselves from one spot to the next, avoiding injury by the skin of their teeth. Often done outdoors, some of the maneuvers these people do are seemingly impossible. While it takes a lot of practice and coordination, this sport can also be super dangerous. Parkour daredevils 
like to take things quite literally to the next level, and as heights get higher and tricks get more technical, disaster's not far behind. Pavel Kashin was a Russian parkour artist who unfortunately learned his lesson the hard way. In 2013, he was performing a stunt on the rooftop of a 16 story building with a friend filming. They ended up capturing the final moments of Kashin's life. He was one of the well known parkour artists or free runners, being named one of the best in the world. He was known for his breakthrough stunts, which you can still find videos of today. On the day of his passing, Kashin was standing on a three foot wide ledge on the top of an apartment building. The daredevil decided to do a backflip on this very small ledge, with him completing the trick only to lose his footing on the landing and be sent over the edge. Kashin's fans and fellow members of the parkour community showed their support and sent respects to his family. His friends uploaded the final image of Pavel mid flip with the permission of his parents to the web. Kashin's parents hoped that the image would deter others from doing the same as their son. Number 9. Wind Turbine Fire If you have ever seen a wind turbine in real life before, you will know just how massive the energy converting monsters actually are. In October 2013, two workers were doing routine maintenance to a 67 meter high turbine in Oltingsplat, Netherlands. Don't come for me, I know I butchered that name, but while they were doing this maintenance, a fire broke out quickly engulfing the only escape route, trapping the workers high above the ground. Due to the height of the fire, the firefighters had a hard time reaching the fire to put it out, so a specialized crew of firefighters were called in with a large crane. Unfortunately, this took hours, which the technicians did not have. In their last moments, a photo of the tragedy was snapped, and in it you can see the turbine in a blaze, but you can also see the two workers embracing in their final moments. The image just amplifies how big the turbine actually is and shows how hopeless a rescue mission would have been. The men were just 19 and 21 at the time. One tried one last effort to survive, with one man jumping from the wind turbine in the last effort to save himself, and the other tried to scale down the side, only to be caught up in the blaze. The man who jumped was found in a field next to the turbine, and the other was found when firefighters were able to finally climb to the turbine. The cause of the fire is unknown, but believed to be a short circuit. While this freak accident ended up taking two lives, the tragedy led to a political inquiry into safety precautions for wind turbine maintenance crews. Their final photo together was sad, but it was nice that in their final moments they did have each other. Number 8. Racing to Disaster Gary Box was one of the many firefighters who was there on 9-11 risking it all in order to save lives. Unfortunately, he was also one of the many who never made it home after that day. Hours before heroically losing his life, Box was photographed racing towards the disaster. The image was taken in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel by a pedestrian in their car. Their engine got stuck in the traffic of the tunnel, so in full gear carrying as much as they could, Box and the rest of his crew started running on foot to ground zero. Gary was 35 at the time and his remains were never recovered. All images taken that day I'm sure have something haunting about them, but knowing how little time he had left is another level. Number 7. Adhesive Bras We'll liven this up a little bit with some vintage history that's it's kind of funny. It's pretty funny. Let's talk about sticky bras, shall we? What a mess this was. Oh my. Back in 1949, Life Magazine released an article that caught everybody's attention, obviously. This was news. This was like a new technology that was being announced. It was May 16th, 1949, and the article read, for 5,000 years, clothes have been draped, tied, buttoned, pinned, and buckled on the human form. This year, for the first time in history, drum roll, they will be glued on. What in the world? How? This is witchcraft. How did that happen? Just one, two, that's it? That's easy. Inventor Charles Langs changed the game, or he thought he did, in 1949. He made these bra cups that would stick to you with adhesive. This, you know, special glue. This special glue. This specific adhesive was promised to leave behind no residue, it was supposed to be painless, yet at the same time, stay glued on even if you were to jump into a pool from a 10 foot diving board. That was the sell. Yeah, well that's not true, that's definitely not true. Well Langs ended up selling the company to Textron later on and the product ultimately failed. Number 6. Nuclear Sight List all right, back to the, you know, back to the dark stuff. Here on Most Amazing, we love lists, right? I'm not sure if you can tell. Smash that thumbs up, hit subscribe, yada yada, we love it. But apparently the US government also fancies a list or two. Who thought? Back when Obama was still running the show, a report was delivered to Congress, or rather it was supposed to be. The 266 page report featuring, you know, every nook and cranny about the US nuclear program. It was released publicly on the government printing office's website in draft form. 
draft form. Couldn't have been easier. Just a casual PDF that shows us maps with stockpiled fuel used for nuclear warheads. Awesome. Right next to your resume. Imagine that. So convenient. How does this even happen? I thought this type of stuff could never happen, right? Well, MIT professor John M. Dutch said that these screw-ups do, of course, happen, and it's normal, and this one here isn't a serious breach. I mean, it certainly sounds serious, but okay. We'll just have to trust the government. Number five, UFOs in the ocean. This video here was leaked in the last couple of years. You've probably seen it, hopefully not. This would be a great day. The footage itself was recorded in 2019 in San Diego. Now the Pentagon has since of course confirmed its authenticity and the UAP, the unidentified aerial phenomenon here, is sphere shaped and it's flying at extremely high speeds. There's no exhaust, no propulsion system whatsoever. It's just a metal ball whipping by San Diego and now, we're questioning our beliefs, so that's fun. The sphere vanished into the water afterwards, into the ocean, and then was never seen ever again. Number four, radar footage. Now normally when we see leaked footage, be it of UAPs or leaked documents, whatever, it's always the worst quality. Like that one, not the best, right? Not quite 4K. It's hard to believe when military footage is poor quality, right? Like how can we see photos of black holes and not even have a photo of a UAP yet, right? What's going on here? Well, Jeremy Corbell, he's here to help. Jeremy? What if he just walked in? That would be crazy. He's not here. That's insane. Jeremy took to Twitter in May 2021 sharing footage of US Navy ships being swarmed by UFOs. Like more than one. Sorry, UAPs. We're not going to call them that anymore. Now this time we have radar footage and that's pretty sweet. That's different. It came from the Combat Information Center aboard the USS Omaha. The 46 second clip was originally recorded July 15th, 2019. You can even hear people in the background reacting to what's happening in real time. You hear panic in their voices. These military personnel in the background, you can overhear them talking about how fast the objects are moving on the radar. So seems very believable this time, right? It's not just a grainy footage. It's like a live reaction kind of. And if he's spooked, we're spooked, right? Number three, Watergate. I have to include Watergate, right? It's one of the biggest scandals in US history. Right in the middle of 1972, there were five men who were all arrested for breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, DC. It was clear that they intended on bugging the place, right? It was fishy, it was obvious, they looked like and spy kids, right? They were up to no good. Now, as the year went on, the election came closer and closer, and all of a sudden, out of the woodwork comes this anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post that the Watergate bugging incident was a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage kicked off by none other than President Nixon himself. It was kicked off by his re-election and directed by officials of the White House. It was a whole planned thing. Now, despite this information leak and it being reported to the news, Nixon was still re-elected. Now these men were clearly linked to a fundraising group for Nixon, but his administration just kept denying any involvement, right? That's the key. Deny, deny, deny. It wasn't until later that year in 1972 when reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, they came forward and exposed everything. Now we got the truth. They exposed the administrator's role in the entire scandal, how they had an inside source, an FBI agent named Mark Felt. It was a whole thing. This ultimately led to Nixon resigning in 1974, the first ever president to do so. Yeah, that's how you know you got caught when you have to resign. Know what I mean? Number two, shadow brokers. Back in August 2016, a group named the Shadow Brokers were the talk of the town. And with that name, how can you not be, right? The shadow brokers would steal cyber weapons from an NSA hacking unit and then proceed to sell them online to the highest bidder. Now this sounds made up. This sounds like it's from a movie. This is crazy, right? Now these tools, these tools in question, these cyber weapons, they've been used by many countries and many not so great sounding schemes. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, you name it, these cyber attacks can happen anywhere, right? The 2019 ransomware cyber attack, that's one example. This incident was connected to the shadow brokers. So whoever this mysterious group is, it still remains a mystery and still sounds made up as sh it sounds like a DC Comics villain. It's insane. And finally, number one, motorized roller skates. We'll end on a fun one because, you know, why not? This last one they've been working on for a very long time and we still can't crack it, right? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen working on this channel, so I gotta end with it. Motorized roller skates. What a nightmare this would be. Imagine if this worked out. Even Elon Musk would see this and be like, no, that's crazy. 
This photo was taken at the Seneca Station in Hartford, Connecticut. Now context aside, this is an odd one. A guy with a briefcase is filling up at the gas station and he's wearing roller skates. That would look bad today. You would have SWAT teams rolling up if you saw that, right? It's 1956 and that futuristic looking man right there is Mike Dreschler. Now at the time he was working for a Detroit skate company, but he was very close to gas powered skates. They would have cost around $250, which today is around $2,400. And it's max speed was 17 miles an hour. Again, imagine that in the closing act of like a Mission Impossible movie. That's crazy. Now obviously the public wasn't supposed to see this. They feared that it would encourage folks to get creative on their own and you know, launch their way to work. So yeah, don't make rocket skates with gasoline. Thanks. Starting us off at number 10, Moko Makai. Long before the interference of European colonists, the Maori people of New Zealand showcased status through a practice called tamoka, which are facial tattoos. These tattoos not only marked a rite of passage, but also signified rank, lineage, and occupation, and were a highly respected and sacred practice. Now, when someone with Moko passed away, either naturally or through battle, they would sever the head from the fallen body and preserve it by boiling it, smoking it, drying it out, and finally dipping it in shark oil. If the person had been killed by a warring tribe, it was kept as a trophy. However, in other cases, families would keep the heads of their fallen loved ones, treasuring them, and only bringing them out for sacred ceremonies. Now, the reason I say all of this is because at first glance, you kind of assume that this guy sitting in front of all these mummified heads was the one to have been responsible. But that's not the case. This man here here, Major General Horatio Gordon Robley served with the British Army during the 1860s and was but one of the soldiers to pillage and steal the heads right out from under Maori people. Disgustingly, he then tried to sell the stolen artifacts back to the New Zealand government, however they ended up being displayed at the American Museum of Natural History instead. Coming in at number 9, Remains of an Astronaut. Infamously known as the man who fell from space, Vladimir Komarov was a famous Russian astronaut or cosmonaut as they were called during the Cold War space race. In 1967, he embarked on a crazy mission that although he was completely trained to complete, was ultimately rushed. Allegedly, the spacecraft had a a multitude of structural issues, and despite engineers warning the Soviet officials that the craft was not ready, they continued with the mission as planned. So Vladimir took off and made his way up into the eternity of space, and even executed 16 orbits around Earth. But along the line, something went awry with his mission, so he was instructed to make his way back down to Earth. However, things went south upon trying to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere when his parachute would not engage, and Vladimir plummeted back towards the earth crashing in a horrific explosion. Rumor has it that while he was plummeting to his fate, he was screaming at the Soviets for forcing him to do this mission. All that remained of him is what you see here. Next up at number 8, Radium Girls. After its discovery in 1898, radium quickly became one of the hottest things on the market. By 1914, the United States Radium Corporation began developing a special glow-in-the-dark paint using radium, which was was mainly used for watches they would send off to soldiers during the war. However, the corruption began after they started hiring young female workers to use said paint to make these radium dials, but despite having an understanding of the harm it could inflict, they did nothing to warn these women, nor did they provide them physical protection from the substance. In fact, they actually assured them that the paint was harmless, and more so instructed the women to make a point out of the brushes with their lips to keep the fine tip for the watches. So the women in each facility began unknowingly ingesting copious amounts of radium, and the process became known as lip dip paint. And some of the girls even began to paint their fingernails, face, and teeth with the stuff, as once again, they had been told it was completely harmless. However, as we know now, that was far from the case, and tragically, many of these radium girls, as they were later coined, either died from the exposure or at the very least suffered extensive poisoning. Tragically, little did the women in this photo know they were already dying a slow and painful death. 
Number seven, George Mallory and Sandy Irvine. On June 8th, 1924, British mountaineers George Mallory and Andrew Sandy Irvine went missing on Mount Everest during their attempt to uh, reach the summit. Mallory and Irvine were part of the British 1924 Mount Everest expedition led by General Charles Bruce. The pair were last seen by their fellow climber Noel O'Dell at an elevation of around 28,000 feet on the northeast ridge of the mountain. The weather on Everest that day was unstable very overcast with snow making for low visibility. After Mallory and Irvine failed to return to their camp, search parties were sent out, but no trace of them was found. Several expeditions in the following years attempted to locate Mallory and Irvine's remains and their camera, hoping to find clues about whether they reached the summit, but it wasn't until 1999 that Mallory's body was discovered on the north face of the mountain. The last photo snapped of them was taken by Noel O'Dell right before they began their ascent. Japan Airlines Flight 123, a Boeing 747, crashed on August 12th of 1985, taking the lives of 520 of the 524 people on board. The crash was caused by severe structural failure, which led to a rapid decompression and loss of control. The last photo recovered from the crash site was taken by one of the passengers on the flight. In the photo, passengers can be seen wearing oxygen masks. The accident was caused by the rupture of the aircraft's rear pressure bulkhead, which separated the pressurized cabin from the unpressurized tail section. The bulkhead had been improperly repaired after a tail strike incident seven years earlier. And the failure of the rear pressure bulkhead led to a sudden and explosive decompression inside the cabin. Decompression caused damage to control cables and systems, making it almost impossible for the pilots to maintain control of the plane. The craft of eventually entered a rapid descent and crashed into a mountain range. There were actually more than four passengers who survived the initial crash, but they died after several hours waiting to be rescued. Japan Airlines Flight 123 crash is one of the deadliest single aircraft accidents in aviation history. Number five, Snake Man. This is the last photo taken of Ali Khan Samsudin. He was known as the Snake King after he spent 12 hours a day for 40 days living with 400 cobras in a small room. He also stayed in a small glass enclosure with 6,000 scorpions for 21 days, earning him the title Scorpion King. His 2006 performance in Kuala Lumpur would sadly be his last, though. During his show, he was bitten by a king cobra, one of the deadliest snakes in the world, with venom powerful enough to take down a full-sized elephant in a matter of hours. Samsudin had been bitten before. He'd even suffered a couple cobra bites before and made it out alive, but this time he didn't recover. His condition just got worse and worse, and the Snake King died in the hospital three days later. Next, we have the last photo of Mayinga Naseka. Mayinga Naseka was a nurse in Zari, now uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, during the 1976 Ebola outbreak. She contracted the Ebola virus while treating patients at Mambalad Hospital in Kinshasa. She caught the virus while treating a nun who had been flown in from Yambuku Mission hospital where the initial outbreak began. Nasaka's case became widely known as she was one of the earliest identified healthcare workers to be infected during the outbreak. And in this photo, you see her standing with another nurse tending to a patient. She died just a few days after this picture was taken. The nurses weren't given the proper protective equipment and there hadn't been any proper precautions taken to prevent contact with the nun's blood or fluids because at the time, it wasn't known just how deadly the virus really was. Next up, we have the 1961 U.S. figure skating team. This is the last photo of the U.S. figure skating team, which was taken at the airport shortly before they boarded Sabina Flight 548. In the photo, team members appeared in high spirits, smiling, posing for the camera. Little did they know that this would be the last moment captured before the tragic event that claimed their lives. On February 15th of 1961, Sabina Flight 548 
Gate, a Boeing 707 aircraft crashed while attempting to land at Brussels Airport in Belgium. The plane was carrying the entire team along with coaches, officials, and other passengers. The crash resulted in the tragic loss of 72 people on board. The cause of the crash never been 100% determined, but the most likely cause was a failure in the plane's flap system combined with poor weather conditions. The pilot struggled to maintain control during the landing attempt, leading to the deadly accident. All right, next up, we have the last photo of Christopher McCandless. On September 6th, 1992, the decomposing body of Christopher McCandless was found in a bus he had been living in just outside of Denali National Park in Alaska. McCandless had embarked on a journey to leave civilization behind and live off the grid. He spent 113 days living off the land, using the bus as his shelter. His journal entries were discovered, and it was likely he died about 19 days before his body was discovered. After living in the bus for over three months, McCandless finally decided he was going to try and make his way back to civilization. But this was unfortunately not going to be as easy as he thought. The river he had crossed to reach the bus was now much higher and swifter than it was when he first ventured in. He decided to turn back, left an SOS note on the bus reading, attention possible visitors, SOS, I need your help. I'm injured, near death, and too weak to hike out. I'm all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I'm collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you, Chris McCandless. McCandless succumbed to starvation while waiting for help that never arrived. When his body was discovered, he appeared extremely gaunt, reportedly weighing only around 60 pounds at the time of his death. And finally, we have Princess Diana. This photo was taken by paparazzi in August of 1997 in Paris. Pictured here is Princess Diana, Dottie Fade, and her driver Henry Paul, and bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones, right before a fatal car accident. Reese Jones was the only survivor. Princess Diana and Dottie Fade were in a romantic relationship. They had been vacationing together in the French Riviera when they were pursued by paparazzi. As they left the Ritz Hotel in Paris, their car was chased by paparazzi photographers on motorcycles trying to capture images of the couple. In the Pont d'Alma tunnel, the car lost control and slammed into a concrete pillar. The impact of the crash was severe, leading to the deaths of Princess Diana and the other two in the car. Of course, the bodyguard did survive, though. The aggressive pursuit by the paparazzi was widely criticized. Some people blamed them for indirectly causing the accident due to their relentless chase, something that I definitely agree with. I hate paparazzi. Like, just come on, get a real job. So the first photo we're taking a look at is this one here. On February 3rd of 1959, musicians J.P. Richardson, also known as the Big Bopper, Richie Valens, and Buddy Holly tragically died in a plane crash near Clear Lake, Iowa, in what is famously known as the day the music died. This is the last photo taken of the three before boarding their final flight. The musicians have been traveling on a small, uh, Beechcraft Bonanza airplane chartered after their tour bus broke down. The plane, piloted by Roger Peterson, took off from the Mason City Municipal Airport en route to Hector Airport in Fargo, North Dakota. The weather conditions on the night of the crash were poor, with a combination of snow, sleet, and fog. And despite these conditions, the flight took off anyway. The plane crashed only a few minutes after takeoff, around 1 a.m., into a cornfield near Clear Lake. There were no survivors. If you like videos just like this, creepy paranormal stuff, cryptid stuff, ghost stuff, we got it all. So hit that subscribe button and don't miss out. Next on the list is the 1943 Glider crash. This is the last photograph taken of William D. Becker, the former mayor of St. Louis, along with several other prominent men in the community, right after boarding a brand new Waco CG4 Glider, manufactured by William B. Robertson, also pictured here. This was going to be the first public demonstration of the aircraft taking flight. Spectators watched from Lampert St. Louis Airport as the men boarded the glider. What they didn't know was that they were witnessing the last moments of these men's lives. The glider was taxied by a plane to a runaway for takeoff. They took flight and once ready to allow the glider to glide, the towing cable was released. Almost immediately after the glider was released though, something terrifying happened. Its right wing completely 
snapped off. Now a wing snapping off of an aircraft spells disaster no matter what type of aircraft it is, but uh, keep in mind these gliders were engineless, created specifically for the war efforts to be released like this and then glide down usually into enemy lines. So now completely on its own and missing a wing, there was no way for it to make a safe landing. It just plummeted towards the earth, crashing into the ground. All 10 men aboard died on impact. Next up, we have the death of Robert Overacker. Robert Overacker was a daredevil from Camarillo, California. At 12.35 p.m. October 1st, he attempted to go over Niagara Falls on a jet ski with the intention of raising awareness about the homeless. And during his attempt, Overacker wore a life jacket and was carrying a flag promoting a charity for the homeless. He had also intended to deploy a parachute at the last moment to escape the fall, but the parachute didn't deploy and he plunged over the falls. This photo was taken just as he went over. He was only 39 years old. At number 7, Rinaldo Dagsa. He was a Filipino politician, a member of the peacekeeping action team, and a corporal in the Philippine Army Reserve Command. Now this photo is not of Dagsa before he passed, but due to how haunting it is, I still had to include it. His passing achieved notoriety due to the picture he snapped of his family on New Year's with unbelievable timing. The image Dagsa captured also inadvertently captured the man who was about to take the shot that would ultimately take his life. The photo was extremely helpful when it came to investigators identifying the shooter because the image shows the gunman quite literally seconds before taking the fatal shot. The picture was taken outside the councilman's house in metropolitan Manila. The photo led to a quick arrest of the shooter as well as his accomplice. Apparently the suspects were known car thieves out on bail, likely holding a grudge against Dexa who had the men arrested a year earlier. It is extremely sad that Dexa unknowingly captured his own final moments, especially with his family being right there, but at least they were able to use it to catch the gunman. Number 6. Discount Flight Keith Sapsard was from Randwick, New South Wales. He passed away just 14 years old with his final moments caught on camera. On February 22, 1970, the teen snuck onto the tarmac at Sydney Airport in Australia with the idea to hide inside a Tokyo-bound plane in order to run away. Unfortunately, Sapsford would never make it to Tokyo. His father described Keith as a curious kid who always had an urge to keep on the move. Due to his restlessness, his parents decided to send him to Boys Town, a Roman Catholic institution specializing in troubled children, for some discipline and structure. Instead, Sapsford escaped from the facility after a couple weeks and headed to the airport. Thanks to the far more relaxed regulations and security of the 70s, Sapsford was able to sneak onto the tarmac with ease. It's unknown if Keith knew where the plane was headed, but he saw a plane preparing for boarding and climbed into its wheel well. It took a few hours for the plane to take off, but eventually it made its way to the sky. What Keith didn't know was that the plane was going to reopen the wheel compartments to retract the wheels. When this happened, Sapsford fell out of the plane, falling 200 feet. One of the craziest things about this tragic event was by pure coincidence. Photographer John Gilpin was simply taking pictures at the airport when he unknowingly snapped a pic at the exact same time Sapsford was falling from the plane. I bet when he developed that roll of film, he was totally surprised. His father later said, All my son wanted to do was see the world. He had itchy feet and his determination to see how the rest of the world lives cost him his life. Obviously what happened to Keith was a tragedy, but the photo captured by Gilpin is remarkable as well as haunting. At number 5, Fatal Friend Brittany Gargle and Cheyenne Antoine were the best of friends until they weren't. Apparently Brittany was extremely hard working. At 16, she was juggling school and two jobs. Antoine had a rough upbringing with her parents falling into substance use. Cheyenne grew up in foster care. At 15, Antoine's mother passed away and to cope with the news, she got involved with some dangerous company also falling into substance use. That's when the two girls met and Brittany helped Cheyenne manage her feelings and the two became close. On March 25, 2015, Brittany posted a picture of her and Cheyenne on social media. The two planned to go out for drinks and have fun, but as the night went on, things got out of hand and the details became fuzzy. The girls traveled to a pub, then to a house party, and then one more pub. Cheyenne claimed that around 4 a.m., Brittany asked a man for a lighter and invited him for drinks, but she didn't know what happened later. Cheyenne heard nothing from Brittany the next day, and later the police received a 911 call of a woman lying on her back, cold to the touch. 
The woman was identified as Brittany. Cheyenne was questioned and her story checked out, but the police thought she was hiding something. As the police dug further, more details came out. In the end, Brittany's passing was ruled a strangling, and this led to oh my god, and this led them to a crucial lead. It was the picture Cheyenne had posted on social media the night of the events. In it, Cheyenne was wearing a stylish black belt, the same belt that had been found at the crime scene. In 2017, after all the evidence collected, Cheyenne was arrested for taking Brittany's life, with Cheyenne claiming not to remember anything due to the substances. In the end, Cheyenne was sentenced to seven years in prison with her release in 2024. At number four, the final dive. Nicholas Mavoli was an American free diver who passed doing what he loved, but not before taking a picture that will give you the chills. Mavoli began free diving competitively in 2012, winning titles twice at the Deja Blue competition and finishing third at the Caribbean Cup in Honduras. With much success in his newfound passion, Mavoli only wanted to take things even further. On November 15, 2013, he prepared to dive into Dean's Blue Hole, hoping to reach 72 meters on a single inhalation with no fins or supplemental oxygen. Surrounded by 15 other athletes and observers, as well as five safety divers, he submerged face first, looking like a human arrow diving into the darkness that would ultimately end up being his last dive. Mike Board, free diving record holder, said diving into a depth with no fins, that's a hard physical dive. I was thinking, okay, he's going to have a hard time getting up. Yet, after a dive of 3 minutes and 38 seconds, Mavoli shot back up to the surface. Unfortunately, instead of celebrating the dive, things quickly turned into a nightmare. Mavoli ripped off his goggles, flashed the OK sign, and attempted to complete surface protocol that would make the attempt official by saying, I am OK. But he wasn't. His words came out jumbled and his eyes were wide and blank. This moment was captured on camera and the blank fear in the diver's eyes is frightening. He lost consciousness and never regained it after suffering a pulmonary edema. Number 3. Dytlov Pass Mystery The Dytlov Pass incident was the event in which nine Soviet trekkers passed away in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, in uncertain circumstances. There are many theories as to what caused the tragedy, but ultimately, it's a mystery. The experienced trekking group from the Yuri Polytechnic Institute was led by Igor Dytlov. Overnight, something seemingly caused the group to cut their way out of their tent from inside and flee the campsite. While them cutting open their tent from the inside is confusing enough, the bodies found were improperly dressed for the heavy snowfall and the freezing temperatures. As the story goes on, things only get further from making sense. After the bodies were discovered, Soviet authorities determined that six had passed from hypothermia, while the other three suffered physical trauma. One had major skull damage, two severe chest trauma, and another had a small skull fracture. Four of the bodies were found lying in a creek, and three of those bodies had soft tissue damage to the head and face. Two bodies were missing missing eyes, one missing a tongue, and another had missing eyebrows. Now, if it had just been the hypothermia, this case would be totally different. But what the heck did all this physical damage in the middle of nowhere? While we aren't sure exactly what went down, there are lots of pictures of the group's final days as well as plenty of theories. There was a new investigation opened in 2019 calling it an avalanche, but I don't know still. Does an avalanche really remove your tongue and eyeballs? Number 2. A Miracle of the Andes On October 13, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, chartered by an amateur rugby team, crashed into the Andes Mountains. The wreckage of the crash was not located for more than two months. There were only 16 out of 45 who survived the whole thing, with the incident gaining international attention after it was revealed the survivors had resorted to cannibalism. Due to the bad weather, the pilot of the plane misjudged their location, and the plane ended up striking a mountain, losing both wings before crashing into a remote valley of Argentina near the Chilean border. A search party was sent out, but due to the white plane on the white snow, it was unable to be spotted from above. After eight days, the search was called off, thinking there were no survivors, though later rescue efforts were taken over by family. There were initially 33 survivors, but due to the elements, injuries, and an avalanche, the numbers were shrinking. Several survivors surveyed the area for an escape route. On December 12th, almost exactly two months since the crash, three men set out to go find help. Though one did return to the crash site after a difficult trek, the other two men finally came across some people. It was December 20th now, and the people they found alerted the authorities. On December 22nd, six survivors were flown to safety, but bad weather meant the remaining eight waited 
until the 23rd. There are photos from both before the crash of the group. There are photos from both before the crash of the group on the plane and after of the group surrounding the fallen plane, as well as books and a movie about the incident. And at number one, a solo hike. In 2014, two women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, were visiting Panama from the Netherlands, and on April 1st, they went on a walk through the scenic forest near the Baru volcano, only to never return. Alarm was raised the day after they didn't return from their hike, and a search party was sent out right away, only to find no sign of Kremers or Froon. A while later, a local woman found Froon's backpack. In the bag, they found her camera, two pairs of sunglasses, some cash, her passport, a water bottle, two bras, and both the women's phones. Probably the most concerning they found were the final images taken on the camera. All of the photos from April 1st are just the two women exploring the jungle. Then there are no pictures until April 8th, when 90 unsettling pictures were taken with the flash in the middle of the jungle, timestamp between 1 and 4 a.m. Most of these images are of complete darkness and the jungle floor, but there are two very alarming pics. One shows some of the women's belongings on a rock, and the other looks like the back of Kremer's head with what appears to be blood stain in her hair. Something else suspicious about the camera is that image 509 was missing, with 508 being the last of them looking okay, and image 510 being the first in the darkness days later. They found a pelvic bone and a foot still inside a boot. Froon's bones appeared to decompose naturally, but Kremer seemed to be stark white as if they'd been bleached, further leading to question if someone else was involved. Starting off this countdown, we have experimental electrical stimulation. Taken in 1856, this photo shows a man undergoing an experiment with electrical stimulation. And by the looks of it, it was quite painful. So back then, they would use the stimulation for a number of reasons. One, to manipulate an experiment on one's nervous system, and two, to treat certain diseases and disorders. Nowadays, this treatment is much safer. They use it to help with injured muscles or manipulate nerves to reduce pain. But back then, they were still trying to get it right. So it makes you wonder how many people underwent these painful experiments, and how many people were accidentally killed before they found the correct voltage to use. In our ninth spot today, we have the lipstick killer. And if you're liking this video so far, then smash that like button because it really helps us out. William George Herons was an American criminal and potential serial killer that confessed to be the lipstick killer. The lipstick killer was someone who took the lives of a number of women and would often leave a creepy message at the scene of the crime in lipstick. That's how he got the name, lipstick killer. The photo I'm about to share with you was a creepy message that he left at the scene of one of his crimes in 1945. He wrote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now this message is creepy for a number of reasons. First, you got a man on the loose who can't control his impulses and he just admitted it. And second, look how creepy it just looks with the lipstick smeared everywhere and such. It took the police six more months from the time this message was written to finally catch William. This photo is just a scary and dark reminder of the horrors this man committed. Moving on to number eight, we have the poverty. This photo from 1948 shows just how bad poverty was in the 1940s to 50s in America. This is when the poverty rate was at its highest. In this photo, Mr. and Miss Ray Shalifo were facing eviction from their Chicago apartment. They were so desperate for money that they had to sell their kids. Now this photo was a stage photo, but it still shows a heartbroken mother not knowing what else to do. Within two years, all four kids were sold into different homes. It also sheds the light on how different laws were back then. Nowadays, that is very much illegal to do. Anyways, this is a very heartbreaking photo. Like I can't imagine what that family went through. Coming in at number seven, Mary Reeser. On the morning of July 2nd, 1951, in St. Petersburg, Florida, Mary Reeser's landlady went up to the old woman's apartment to deliver a telegram. But upon her arrival, notice something strange, that her door was warm to the touch. Still, she opened it nervously, and to her horror, she found Mary almost completely reduced to a pile of ashes on her chair with only a small part of her left leg and her shockingly shrunken skull remaining. But what exactly happened to Mary? Well, that's kind of the million dollar question. Local authorities were unable to determine the cause of the fire as the rest of the apartment was relatively unscathed. And when the FBI became involved, they determined Mary had essentially gone up in flames like the wick of a candle while her own body fat fed the flame. But still, the question of how the fire started in the first place remained unanswered. Often referred to as the cinder lady, there was a theory at the time that Mary suffered spontaneous human combustion, but whatever it was that happened certainly left a terrifying crime scene. Coming in at number six, 
19th century cure for mental illness. Over the years, there have been countless terrible ideas related to the cure for mental illness. In the early to mid 1900s, for example, the lobotomy was a popular method to fix the issue. At other points in time, they believed removing a part of the skull could do the trick. Prior to this, it was common practice to generate a near death incident like drowning. Well, of course, back before the idea of depression or other mental illnesses were truly understood as a concept, it was believed to be a demon, and a good old exorcism was the way to go. However, there is one practice I had never even heard of until I saw this photo from 1890. As you can see here, this photo shows a woman being held up in a sort of crucifix pose and forced to face a wall. And after doing a bit of deep diving, it turns out this was a pretty standard practice in mental institutions in the 19th century. At the time, it was believed that this could cure what they referred to as insanity, although I don't know how any of these people thought forcing someone to stand while being chained up and staring into nothingness was going to help them feel better. I mean, if I didn't know any better, I would think this was some kind of evil prisoner. Just goes to show how corrupt and cruel asylums were back in the day. Coming in at number five, the last public guillotine. I don't know about you, but I am always shocked when I remember that the last public execution via guillotine was in 1939. It just feels so medieval that I can't believe there are people alive today who could have witnessed such a thing happen. The man facing his death was named Eugene Weidman, and to be fair, he was no peach. Convicted for kidnapping and killing multiple men and women, but even so, it's wild to me that this photo is less than 85 years old. According to news articles from the time, the crowd went wild when he was brought out of the prison and towards the giant blade. Observers were reportedly hooting, hollering, and whistling during the event, even going so far as to dab up the dead man's blood with their handkerchiefs as a souvenir. After the event, authorities decided that what had long been intended to serve as a deterrent for bad behavior had turned into a rowdy, gladiator type fest, and so France ultimately decided to outlaw public execution entirely. And speaking of people we know that witnessed such things, famous actor Christopher Lee, who played Saruman in Lord of the Rings, was apparently at this very execution. Coming in at number four, hotel manager. At first glance, it's a bit tricky to tell what's going on in this photo. However, after doing a bit of searching around, the story behind it all is much darker than meets the eye. Taken during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, this image you are seeing here shows a group of both black and white folks enjoying a dip in the pool while the hotel manager is pouring some kind of liquid into the water. Now, before I get into what's happening in this photo, let me first explain what happened seven days prior. So remember, at this time, segregation was still in full swing, and this hotel was whites only. Reportedly, a week before this photo was taken, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested for trespassing at this very hotel after being asked to leave from its segregated restaurant. Now, there were some people staying at this hotel who, rightfully so, thought this was not okay, and so the white guests invited black people to join them in the pool as their guests in an attempt to protest the segregation of the facility. However, the manager, Jimmy Brock, was not a fan of this protest, and in this photo here, you'll see he's pouring a bottle of hydrochloric acid into the pool to scare away the swimmers. Again, just another thing to add to the long list of atrocities committed to people of color in our world. Coming in at number three, Blanche Monnier. Born in 1849, Blanche Monnier was a well-respected French socialite from a conservative bourgeoisie family. Acclaimed for astounding beauty, by her early 20s there were plenty of suitors who fancied her hand, and by 1876, at the age of 27, she finally found a man who she wished to marry. However, the man in question, a penniless lawyer, was not to her mother's liking. And so, in a fit of disapproval, her mother decided to lock her daughter in a tiny dark room in the attic of their home, where poor Blanche remained hidden from sunlight and humanity for the next 25 years of her life. Now, beyond the obviously 
awful parts about this decision. Her mother spent the next 25 years claiming her daughter was missing, playing the victim of a mourning mother. Meanwhile, with the help of her son and Blanche's brother Marcel, let her daughter literally rot, starve, and go mad in isolation. That was until May of 1901 when the Paris Attorney General received an anonymous letter revealing the location and depravity of Madame Monnier's prisoner. And when the police arrived, they couldn't believe their eyes. As you can see in this photo, Blanche was in an unrecognizable state, covered in rotten food, her own feces, and weighing a mere 50 pounds. Police said the stench in that room was so vile, they could barely stay long enough to get her out of there. In the end, Blanche was taken to live the rest of her life in a facility as she suffered extreme mental health disorders from the cruelties she experienced. Though sadly, justice was never really served. Her mother died shortly after she was found, and her brother was acquitted as at the time, duty to rescue was not a part of the penal code. Coming in at number 2. Rings. Starting in 1933 up until the end of World War II, we are all very well aware that the evil German party operated more than a thousand camps and inflicted some of the most cruel, inhumane, and diabolical acts on millions of prisoners, especially targeting the Jewish population. Now, while this is by no means the most awful photo depicting this period in time, it does however showcase the gravity in a new light. This photo dating back to May 5th, 1945, shortly after the defeat of the dictatorship, US troops stumbled across this giant box of wedding rings prisoners were forced to remove so that the party could repurpose the high quality gold. Among these rings, they also found watches, eyeglasses, gold fillings that would have been extracted from the prisoners' teeth, and precious stones. And so while this photo may look rather innocent compared to some of the others on this list, it is in fact anything but. And last up in our number one spot, human zoos. It's no secret that humanity has done some incredibly messed up and cruel things through the years. War, genocide, slavery, to name a few. However, this photo dating back to 1904 shows yet another mind boggling atrocity. As you can see, this photo shows what used to be an actual attraction at the Coney Island Zoo in the early 20th century, imprisoned Filipino people, which is beyond disgusting. Apparently these attractions began in the late 19th century and were very popular up until the mid 1950s as the western world was desperate to see what at the time was viewed as a primitive and savage lifestyle. I know. It's gross. This one in particular was reportedly intended to show off the fact that the US had recently claimed the Philippines and visitors would come by to watch the prisoners inside while throwing peanuts at them. Now, I should clarify, it was not just Coney Island doing this. Zoos containing captured indigenous peoples from Asian and African countries were very popular in other countries like France, England, Spain, Italy, as well as the United States. But either way, it's beyond revolting that this was a thing to begin with, let alone that it went on for so long. Mm -hmm. 